Hello, dear class. Uh, it's a nice day on which to talk to you about the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> it's the day on which, in two hours' time, I'm getting my second immunization jab, uh, which will render me immortal, as if. But it feels like it at this moment. Would you like the immortality jab? Oh, yes, please. So the Marquis, who is immortal, immortalized by his works, uh, that's a meditation in itself, something we ought to uh, consider and confront. Um, here's a man uh, who had what you might say were uh, perfectly uh, banal uh, ideas, uh, fantasies, imagination, insights, philosophies. Um, I mean, not everyone, it's true, I assume, not everyone has persistent fantasies of whipping and sodomizing uh, mostly girls, but uh, young men or older men on occasion. Um, not everyone has those fantasies, and if they did, and I guess plenty of people do, they don't have the stamina to write about it as extensively. So does he deserve his immortality for the stamina of his lubricious, lascivious fantasies? Does he, Is that enough? Uh, it has to be answered, that question. Obviously, there's, there is explicit philosophy mixed in. Uh, let's suppose you uh, read some of Juliette already, uh, when she's being educated, the passionate uh, lesbian ladies that she encounters uh, are also philosophizing for us, as uh, uh, de Sade is himself, about uh, in order to seduce uh, the, the innocent, temporarily innocent Juliette, um, they uh, talk about, uh, uh, they try to disabuse her of ideas uh, about religion, and morality and say, no, the, the only pleasure uh, lies in immorality or amorality um, and evil is the only game in town. And that's a philosophy, I guess. Uh, the question is, in what sense do you regard that as a philosophy? And that somehow it remains the key to uh, what you feel about de Sade. Um, I don't think, I haven't come across many uh, uh, commentators, and there are many brilliant and famous, celebrated, wonderful commentators who have talked about the Marquis de Sade and, and his significance, which they, uh, on which they insist. Um, and they don't talk about the sex. Uh, I don't think they feel that the, uh, the endless recital from a certain distance, which is what fascinates me, not close in, I mean, as close in as you probably want to get, but you're not invited sufficiently into characters about whom you could possibly care. I suppose that Justine might be an exception, not Juliette, but her sister Justine. But on the whole, and she's screaming and wailing and being abused, but on the whole, there's no one there you care about, and the configurations, the endless permutations, the math of the Marquis, uh, it's all it seems to be is permutations in all his books. Um, as much as I've read of them, he said quickly. Um, but it's true that I, I find it impossible to read more than a few pages. There are writers of whom that's true, but mostly because of the immensely demanding complexity of their work. Whereas in the case of the Marquis, my difficulty in staying with it is the, the absence of complexity, the interminable repetition. I mean, I shouldn't be saying this to you to try and influence you to think my way. I hope you won't. I, 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 if you have a contrary opinion, I long to hear it. But my, my problem is that um, uh, when you've seen one sodomy, you've seen them all, at least as, uh, as sodomy is described by the Marquis de Sade. I, I don't think there's any variety in it, nor in that sense does it resemble reality at all. After all, it, it cannot be said uh, of our own, in reality, sexual encounters, that when you've uh, seen one or heard about one, uh, you've heard about all of them. I think we know quite well that 
they're not entirely predictable in that way. Uh, however, they are in, in the Marquis, and that's, in a sense, part of the fantasy is let's enter a world where every sodomy is the same and every whipping is the same, and, uh, and it's deeply satisfactory. And all that says is, this is something you're doing, Marquis, uh, uh, to keep alive your libido and perhaps literally your erections uh, while you are in prison in the Bastille or the madhouse at Charenton, which is a much more generous establishment in its behavior towards uh, the Marquis. Um, that's what you're doing here. You're not giving us, you know, if, if only as a pornographer, because um, uh, he's, I don't think he is that. He's a mathematician. He, he assembles rigmaroles. But if only he would say to us, there was one sodomy in my life that was supreme and unlike every other, and I will take you to it. I don't want to go to it personally, but I could imagine there are people who do, and it would make sense. Um, you know, if you take a book that is, for me, uh, almost as difficult to read, American Psycho, a famous uh, contemporary novel about a man who uh, dismembers uh, uh, other human beings. Um, and although that's kind of rather banal in a way, if, if you treated it uh, the way Saad treats the whippings and the, and the sodomies, uh, you know, each, each dismemberment would take, you know, a, a short paragraph and we'd be on to the next, presumably. But in American Psycho, we remain with each dismemberment. That much I could tell. I can't read. I cannot bring myself to read closely that kind of uh, violence against another body. Um, but, but there you have something that could be arousing, uh, is at least uh, real in the sense that you know it, it might go wrong at any minute. It's not the automatic mechanical sodomy and whipping that you encounter in the Sad. And I think that automaton quality is, the, for me, possibly the most important thing about the Sad. There is his philosophy, his denial of God, his denial of any authority he can find to insult. I, I, I enjoy his, his uh, lifelong rebelliousness and refusal to take orders. I, I, I like that. Um, I don't know that life is always uh, simple as that. I mean, that's a relatively simple response until they throw you out or string you up or do whatever they do to people who will not cease from uh, refuting and insulting authority. But I love him for his anti-authoritarianism and that connects to uh, his uh, campaign against God, his refusal of morality, and so on and so forth. And there are many aspects to this nihilism that uh, contemporary writers have identified as um, unprecedented. So they identified Assad as the father of all kinds of uh, uh, liberations from, uh, from religious thinking, from moralizing thinking, and they celebrate his um, unmediated sense of, of freedom and liberation. I personally find that almost as predictable as his sodomy and whipping. <laughs> but I can see that philosophers concentrate on on that rather than the sodomy and whipping. And I'm, I'm, I'm in, I mean, I understand that move. Um, and so what else do we have? Uh, we have the rather wonderful story of, of the Marquis and uh, how lucky he was. Oh my God. Um, he should have lost uh, the whole of the 120 Days of Sodom, his, as it were, masterpiece, although I'm, I'm at a loss to uh, uh, praise one of his works above the other. I can see that Juliette is different. Uh, she's a murderess or a murderer. Uh, she uh, uh, is, is a blast on behalf of, of the idea that women, too, could practice uh, what de Sade preaches. And that's a great excitement. Uh, to feminists, and I see why, because in, in there, Saad refuses uh, the macho 
uh, patriarchy, patriarchality of uh, the thinking and the writing that we have, that, we be, that are bequeathed to us by the centuries. And uh, he's right to be, if not praised, certainly identified as, uh, uh, as a feminist forebear, even though the things that uh, Juliet does are not necessarily <laughs> a model for feminists to follow. And I think almost all feminists would agree with you on, on that particular, on that narrow issue. So there's the, uh, uh, there is uh, much to be enjoyed in the, uh, in the Marquis's extraordinary life. He was so fortunate, unfortunate, and in that he left the manuscript of the 120 days uh, behind the wall, it tucked into the wall. He couldn't get it out in time, but somebody found it, even when they, they looted and burnt down the Bastille and Saad at Charenton was in tears to hear this. No, somebody found it and kept it for us. On the other hand, his son, uh, burnt an enormous multi-volume orgiastic book and uh, quite a few of Saad's papers. Other collections of Saad's papers have turned up and we have letters of his and we have other other writings. Uh, I don't personally feel the loss of another multi-volume work of interminable <laughs> sodomy and whipping. <laughs> it's just that one good sodomy is uh, sufficient for me to get the idea. Uh, likewise, whipping. And he liked, as his characters do, to be sodomized as well as to do it, to be whipped as well as to whip. Uh, this is interesting to me uh, psychologically. I can't imagine, I can imagine, I can dimly imagine wanting to whip somebody about some people in this life. I would love to whip, although I wouldn't carry it out even if the circumstances made it possible. But I would love to do it. I'd love to fantasize about it. But I don't want to be whipped. I don't want to be sodomized. I don't terribly want to sodomize anybody, but I don't want to have it done to me. And so I find it hard to step across the threshold into a world of reciprocity where you want to do it and have it done to you at the same time. Anyhow, uh, the, the, the poor Marquis in and out of the Bastille and then in Charenton where he had actually wonderful freedom and had a mistress and had his ex-wife and ex-mother-in-law uh, living there, helping him out, loving him, adoring him. What was it? What was it? His wife was faithful. His mother-in-law just loved him to death, uh, although she tried to keep him on the straight and narrow. <laughs> somehow, somehow that acquires a sexual uh, uh, quality as one utters the phrase but she tried to keep him within bounds. Oh God, there's the joke again. You have to bind somebody to whip them after all. So those weren't the binds, the bounds that she had in mind. Um, and she didn't succeed in, in uh, moderating his, his passions at all. He also had uh, Constance, his mistress, who lived there with him. He had a four year long affair with Madeleine, who was one of the um, nurses, if that's right, in the, in the hospital there. Uh, he had a lot of, uh, of pleasure, even though they were interrupted by orders not to write and they removed his pen and the ink and so on and so forth, and it was an endless battle. But he had a pretty fortunate life, and the story of his life in the Revolution is just a, a wonderful novel in itself. How nearly he was executed, having rebelled against Robespierre, which shows his common sense. And he was already, by declaring himself uh, citoyen Saad, citizen Saad, joining the revolution, taking various offices uh, in the revolutionary party. He was already doing the most extraordinary volte farce, uh, and he he his, uh, pronounce his announce his anarchism, his socialism, his revolutionary ideas are truly very far-reaching and and take us right into the twentieth century, uh, and and that is interesting. Uh, also interesting is that uh, his ex-wife was able to. Uh, at his mother-in-law, prevail on, on people in the revolutionary government not to execute him. And there was one time when he was on the list to be put in the cart that day to go to the guillotine. And it just happened that the door to his cell, on which was, was, was inscribed an X, meaning take this guy, the door itself was open, open all the way back against the corridor wall. And so the man went by without seeing that Saad was marked with an X and should have been hauled out, put in the cart and guillotined. By such incredible pieces of luck did the, the Marquis survive and other wondrous stories. So 
I, I commend him to you as an extraordinary case in many different ways. And I'm curious to know uh, your views uh, on that uh, and on him and Lord help us on such of his works as you can manage to read a page or two. Thank you for your patience. Bye now.